following debate on uh, the question I think that is very current today. Does research require evidence? Since we started our PhD course back in 2012, that uh, custom or idea to have a public debate open for faculty, not only for our doctoral researchers. Um, looks like uh, some interaction, and now we are in the fifth edition of this public debate. As most of you know, the public debate is part of um, the PhD course that we are organizing this week. Uh, the course is called Standardizing and Theory Building in Management Research. You can learn more about uh, our course and our activities around this course from this um, links. We are, as I mentioned, proud to announce that we have a jubilee cohort of students here in this room. This will celebrate more or the fifth year of the, of the course. So uh, uh, there's something from uh, all over the place, all over Europe, all over the world. And uh, this is the third day of the course. And uh, clearly, as I mentioned, the public debate is open to the faculty. And um, we'll have the debate on this issue. But before I want to uh, discuss the, the topic of the debate, I want to emphasize what we bring in uh, as part of the PhD course. This is the results that we tried to work yesterday with the, with the researchers around the phenomenon. This is not the final, this is just work in progress, this is the process. But just to give you a flavor, the background and experiences that our researchers bring to the course, and uh, I think this is what makes it uh, interesting. Um, the motion of the debate is this. Within the context of management research, knowledge is best advanced without evidence. Um, it is a provocative uh, motion, and uh, when we talked about the top of the debate, then we said it is very current, it's very uh, trendy to discuss these ideas. If you look what happened to Brexit, um, clearly uh, you may argue there was a lack of evidence around what happened, or um, so to speak, fake news around what happened. Right? So do we need evidence to do something? Apparently, uh, somehow things are happening without proper evidence. Then uh, the rise of pseudoscience. And that was interesting, uh, like fart cures cancer. So, so that's uh, another question is what kind of evidence do we have to, to develop, uh, to do science or pseudoscience? And uh, we discussed the, the, uh, this uh, type of the emotion. That was somehow driven by what is happening or is happening uh, in the world today. So, what the debate is today? Uh, we have uh, Nicholas Dalaka, Professor of Peters at the University of Rhode Island, um, and uh, Dr. Andy Law from Grounding Theories in California. Somewhere here, I have a very brief. Um, uh, Nick has been in, uh, very active in, uh, in marketing, in uh, globalization studies, um, in media, social media studies, or in fact on social media on, uh, on behavior. Um, he's been visiting uh, professor around the world. Uh, Nick and I worked together on a couple of uh, research articles and Andy Law is a fellow of Gaulle Theories in California. Andy is very passionate about doctoral researchers, uh, about streamlining the patient process as part of supervision. Um, some of you may know he uh, authored one of the best selling books on uh, management and research uh, management. With the uh, two co authors. And currently, he's working on another uh, book on grounded theory. Um, Andy and I, we go back together from my studies back in Strasbourg in uh, 
Purely because uh, we will have, just as a way of saying, we'll have a, a, a Skype call with Barbie Glazer uh, later this week. Again, prophecy to uh, Andy Law. I will change the date. As you can see, I'm still in the middle. I'll try it. Not the distance of the sort, but at least the distance to make sure that they didn't know. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, Ami is losing his voice, so I'm not sure how he will be <laughs> fit to fight. <laughs> um, but what we'll do with the, the, uh, to start with, we'll, uh, we'll um, as you can see, we adopted a uh, Anglo Saxon uh, format for the debate. To start with a bit of confrontational, we'll see how it goes towards the end. Um, we pre previous years we had a mixture of um, the formats, we had a Scandinavian format, now we have a more confrontational format. Uh, so <clears throat> what we'll start with, we'll try to uh, we'll vote in the first place. So uh, who is for the motion and who is against the motion? Then uh, Nico have 15 minutes to try to convince him that we do need evidence to do science. Then 15 minutes, Andy will try to convince him that we do not need evidence to do science or advanced knowledge, so to speak. Then we'll open up for debate, for questions. Then each debater will have uh, five minutes to for closing statements in reverse order probably and uh, then we'll vote again and see if the process changes your mind in terms of do we really need evidence to create knowledge okay so uh, let's vote now in the first place so who is in the favor of the motion i.e. who do not need evidence do not need evidence in the motion uh, yes I think so I think it should be a secret thing. <laughs> Is it? I think it should be a from a bit of paper. Oh. Okay. So uh, let's uh, let's do that then. Do you have some piece of paper? Okay. So. Just say Andy or Nick. Yeah. So vote for Andy or for Nick. Yeah. And, uh, so if you're for evidence, it's Nick. If it's uh, against evidence, it's
Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you with utmost humility, but also with utter conviction that research always requires evidence. Research without evidence is a day without sunshine, a cart without a horse, a, nay, a fish without water, essentially dead. In everyday life, we know this quite well. You, of course, remember the film noir style movies and TV shows. <coughs> where the street voice detective says, the facts, man, just the facts. He knows very well that hard empirical evidence is what he needs to solve the case. Not hunches and conjectures from the beguilingly beautiful woman that he is interviewing. He needs hard evidence, just the facts, ma'am. The great detective Sherlock Holmes knew this as well. This is where I have requested the puck. In the right. <laughs> At the crime scene, the sharply observant Holmes could see the scattered shreds of evidence all around, while the befuddled Dr. Watson, presumably trained in science, but ob oblivious to the obvious, kept wondering how his detective friend came up with such a clear-cut theory about how the crime was committed while he was completely lost as to what the heck was going on. Now these are of course uh, the more popularly known anecdotal ways of supporting my case. Uh, that we need hard facts, hard empirical data, hard evidence, in, even in everyday life situations. But our debate topic is a little bit more at a higher level. It is about research, it, it is about knowledge, systematic knowledge generation, it is about science. So seriously, even in the philosophy of science also, there is strong and powerful argument that the advance of knowledge needs evidence. Indeed, it needs a torrent of evidence. The Austrian British philosopher Karl Popper was, the unequiv was unequivocal in his support of empirical truth or empirically derived truth. He said, and I'm quoting Karl Popper here, our aim as scientists is objective truth, more truth more interesting truth, more intelligible truth. It is well worth searching for truth. And we do this chiefly by searching for mistakes so that we have to correct them. So this is one of the many famous quotes from Professor Karl Popper. In the Popperian world, not only do truth and knowledge require evidence, but the quest for evidence is unending. Having gathered evidence that something seems plausibly true, we need to gather further evidence that what seems to be plausibly true is simply not an artifact, that it is not an error of data collection an error of method or an error of inferential logic. So we have to have get evidence and then we have to pile on more evidence and then we have to pile on even more evidence. That is knowledge creation, that is science. Some may suggest, totally falsely, 
I assert that there is an alternative to empirical knowledge. That knowledge can be gleaned from intuition or perhaps by divine inspiration entering our brains. But, ladies and gentlemen, please think. Our brains are very much the products of our empirical material universe. In general, our adult brains come from a long evolutionary heritage. Our specific individual adult brains develop our, our empirically programmed genetic makeup, our genetic code, and from the empirical reality of our upbringing as children in our families, and in our school settings. So even if things are emerging from our brain, there is an empirical reality that led to that brain. Every idea, every intuition, every inspired bit of theoretical insight in our brain can be traced to empirical roots that are atavistic, genetic, and developmental. Every aspect of our brain derives from brute empirical facts, including every shred of intuition growing in our brain. A telltale trail of evidence, empirical breadcrumbs that lead to our, to our ancestors to our parent imparted X and Y chromosomes and to our childhood experiences, again empirical experiences, connects what we seem to know also intuitively to facts, to data, to the observable universe, to recorded history, and to the genetic and carbon mappings that make us what we are. So we are essentially uh, carbon beings uh, with sentience, obviously, but we are empirical entities. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, whether we go by popular lore and images, such as the one I showed you of the gumshoe in the street interviewing just the facts man, Sherlock Holmes, or we go by respected philosophers uh, like Karl Popper. The best thinking available in the popular world as well as in the philosophy of science uh, seems to hold that the advance of knowledge via research requires evidence. The case that we can derive knowledge from intuition or inspiration by means other than empirical evidence is very, very, very weak. So, ladies and gentlemen, my plea to you is that this case should be dismissed for lack of evidence. Thank you very much.
And all this is in the context of management research. We're not talking about biology. Well, we're not talking about any other biology. We're talking about things which this faculty is interested in, which is basically different flavors of management. The problem is that in, in the world of management, truth is stranger than fiction. And yet fiction rules the world. So if you really want to know what's going on in a human-based organization, you have to understand that fictions are built into and are part of vested social structures. The socially vested structures are the formal requirements of the formal organization of social life. The effect of these fictions is often to lead to a miss of what's really going on in the social arena. Thus, these fictions usually lead to a preconceived professional problem to do research on that do not exist. So there are people all over the academic uh, universe that are diligently researching fake issues that don't exist. They only exist in their own mind. They don't get any, any reality, any, any, any comparison to reality. <clears throat> you don't have to take my word for it. Managers are programmed to deliver this proper life. The institution of fiction means, is a mean, as a means of perpetuating reality, enables several myths in management to be perpetuated by most academic researchers who use deductive research uh, methodologies. I forgot to mention that this word evidence should not be confused with data. Of course you need data to do research, but it isn't always evidence. You only need evidence if you know what you're looking for. You need the evidence to confirm or reject what you're looking for. But since the world of management is based on fiction, we don't always know what we're looking for, and therefore evidence will be just getting away. But we do need data. In the marketing field, there's a myth, myth of consumer sovereignty. As Gal Gray called it, there is always a presumption of consumer sovereignty in the marketing economy. The unidirectional flow of instruction from consumer to market to producer. This sequence no longer holds. It was right in this in 69. The mature corporation has readily had the means for controlling the prices at which it sells as well as those at which it buys. Similarly, it has the means of managing what the consumer buys at the prices at which it controls. If you look across the automobile, uh, automobile industry by any consumer industry, you will see that similar products are similar, similarly priced. Surprise, surprise. Then there's relationship marketing. This is another myth. The myth of marketing, of relationship marketing, is that uh, in business people have relationships and it's a win-win, benign situation. Oh no, it isn't. Because what happens, they use pseudo-friendly, which is a kind of false friendship, to nurture friendship, to create quite loyalty, and the most important thing, to anaesthetize them from opportunistic behavior. We don't want them to think. We want them to get sucked into what we want to do. Benign relationships appear to be the central in existing research, the exclusion of the less transparent instrumental behavior which are widespread. Because they're looking for evidence of this benign relationship, they miss all the other stuff. So management research is distinctive because to be a manager is eclectic. In other words, you have to be multitasking, minute by minute, you're not doing just one thing. So it's complicated. If you go in looking for something, you might be looking for the wrong thing. Managers are powerful, busy people, and they can't be bothered with questionnaires, forums, interviews, and other intrusive research methods. So you have to be more creative. Management requires both thought and action. Managers have to work in the environment of great variability. Things change, they change perpetually. Managers are experts in the proper life. So, other myths include the myth of consumer focus and probity in universal facts. Put simply, this means that for generations, Retail banks in particular, 
uh, put about them is that we like our customers. We always do things in your best interest. They never mention credit defaults to us. They never mention Ponzi schemes. They never mention all kinds of fraud, which is still going on all the time. The myth of responsible corporate citizenship. Any corporation that's operating in a Western capitalistic environment, by law, has to have a corporate mission statement in their final accounts. And um, if you listen to the flowery language that goes across, in United Airlines, corporate mission statement, you know, they, we put the customer in front of everything. What they didn't say, except when we want to reaccommodate you. The myth of corporate mergers, mergers that do not exist, they are all, they are all technical. Read my paper on um, default remodeling and you'll see why. And the PR department are in hyperdrive when uh, these so-called mergers happen because it's very bad press when people lose their jobs, businesses go out of business, and all sorts of nasty things happen. And even when you take the macroeconomic analysis of so-called mergers, the net result doesn't make any kind of economic sense. It's about short-term opportunism for certain entities. So why, so to do research without evidence but with data, you use, use induction. And that means that your role is to try and establish an hypothesis rather than to test an hypothesis. And by doing this, it reduces the disjuncture between academics and practitioners. I also, part of my academic life, worked in one of Europe's largest marketing departments, academic marketing departments. And there was a vast gulf between the academics researching marketing and those who actually did marketing. And I once said to my boss, don't you think it would be a good idea if we had on the board of the university some people who actually do marketing? They said, oh no, they, they wouldn't understand it. Inductive research reveals the perspectives of those being researched. It does it. Inductive research is free from the preconceptions embedded within the interests of the professional research community. Uh, Inductive research is capable of capturing the authentic nature of managerial work. I'm going to skip the next bit. So, having said that there is a dichotomy between research, which is based on evidence, and research that's based in data, which is not evidence. Actually, both approaches do contain elements of each. In deductive research, the decision as to which hypothesis to test is often a very subjective inductive process. In deductive research, the choice of which literature to read and review is frequently influenced by the highly subjective choices the researcher decides to make. Once the results of a deductive research study have been revealed, they then have to be interpreted. This again is highly subjective. It's quite possible to look at evidence, the same evidence, and come up with quite different conclusions. In inductive research, the researcher has to categorize the data before it can be explained. And this is a process of deduction. Now our friend Mr. Popper comes back. He says, although typical social conditions through regular recurrence can be averted, these are detectable regular social life, they, they do not have the character of immutable regularities of the physical world. In other words, statistical methods of the social sciences and quantitative mathematical models of physics are very different, and it is misleading to imply that they are the same. Historicism claims that the historical rel relativity of social laws makes most scientific methods using physics inapplicable to sociology. In simple language, what this is saying is that when you use evidence-based research, you are making assumptions that what has happened in the past will also happen in the future. You are a prisoner of history. 
It's called historicism. Whereas reality it doesn't happen in the future, it doesn't happen in the past, and so in fact it happens right now. And so to catch reality, you have to be more inventive. My final point is that um, within the field of management, the dominant research paradigm is the evidence research based approach or the deductive approach. And in itself, it's not bad, but the, the difficulty comes when it becomes dominant. And when it's dominant, there is a prejudice and bias of academic gatekeepers to international journalism. Because they assume there's only one, to do, only one way to do this, and it's our way. And if you're not doing it our way, you're doing it wrong. Many academics who do research into management are more interested in the application of their favorite methodology rather than understanding what is really going on in the research context. Academics are more concerned in gaining status and recognition than in discovering the main concerns of those who are researching. Deductive research gives the appearance of being very scientific and sophisticated, whilst in reality, much of it is merely following rather simple procedures that look more complex and profound than they really are. So, I come to the end of the piece of here, and I'll leave you with this thought, that if you really want to know what's going on, why don't you ask the people, and listen to the people, instead of just guessing what you think they are doing, and have a bit of humility. And my final, final point is a very important one, especially in the PhD context. When, P, when researchers are in a dominant paradigm of deductivism, evidence-based research, it stifles intellectual autonomy amongst researchers because undue deference has to be given towards all these people who have written stuff in the past, many of whom were rubbish and irrelevant. And because they're in important, powerful positions, you have to touch your forehead to them. Well, if you are an author, you should stand on your line of argument. And it's very difficult to let your line of argument flourish if all the time you are beaten down by having to read all this stuff before you can get on with your job. Thank you for listening. Now uh, we open up for a Q&A session, but before um, uh, I want to say a few words about to add a flavor to the reasons um, why we're doing this. I mentioned a couple of those, but also from uh, uh, our science perspective. Uh, recently, for example, the IB uh, scholars raised the concerns and somehow this is discussed in many conferences that there is no clear, strong correlation between internationalization and company performance. The, the studies are inconclusive, and that's interesting finding in itself. As recently, a paper was published in Strategic Management Journal, where they're questioning the, the strength of, uh, and consistency of findings in strategic management. And the one, one of the reasons people would argue that the Although we talk about replication studies, but nobody wants to replicate studies because people say, well, what's new in there? But I think this is one, one of the reasons there's no consistency in, in what's happening is because there is no consistent replication and, uh, of studies. But I'll leave this uh, here and then I will open up for questions and we'll use this microphone to, to ask questions. So. Thank you very much for, for the debate and the discussion. Uh, going back to, to some of the philosophers discussing this uh, issue, we, we can <coughs> look into to Nietzsche uh, saying that a uh, long time ago that there are no facts, there are only interpretations. Uh, so, so the matter of facts and evidence, uh, what is that? For me. Well, as you saw in my 
presentation, I, I was using evidence uh, as absolutely equivalent to empirical reality, uh, empir empirical observable reality. Uh, and uh, so I would argue that, uh, but, but I think what you are saying is that uh, everything is, is a conjecture, right, in, 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 at one level. Was, was that your point? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a matter of how can we be sure about what we see? And we have a position in relation to what we observe. Right. So, so, right. so, so the matter of empirical objects and, and the facts depends on something else than the object. Yes, and, and uh, again, if, if we uh, go back to the Popperian uh, view, uh, the argument from uh, Popper would be that you can never get rid of uncertainty. Uh, and because you cannot get rid of uncertainty, you have to do even more to amass uh, evidence, facts, empirical data, and so forth, because all you are doing is uh, trying to, to uh, uh, approximate uh, the truth, because truth is unach unachievable in, in, even in the Popperian view. Uh, so all that evidence and data and empirical facts are doing is helping us incrementally reduce uncertainty, not eliminate it, and at the same time gradually increasing our confidence and that is why in the positivist empiricist uh, uh, research there is always the p-value reported, right? Uh, which is the confidence level uh, that the researcher has in, as to that this particular finding that they have discovered through empirical facts and uh, with, with a lot of analytical uh, spin put on it, uh, it is still increasing the confidence level nine to 99%. It, it is never 100 percent. So that that would be my kind of view that, that from the empiricist side, uh, that yes, nothing is ever certain, but the quest to approach that uh, through empiricism should never be given up. Later on. I love you, so the more I like it. Anything <laughs> <laughs> else with the questions? Research if you are doing hypo deductive research. 
And that is very useful. But I argue that that kind of research has been done to death in the area of management, and it's gone as far as it's likely to go. So I'd suggest they have another approach. Your second question was, was it abduction? Okay. Now, my friend Michael is far more erudite on this subject, so I'll hesitate to answer, then pass the microphone to Michael in deference. And basically, as I understand it, after there is induction, which is trying to discover an hypothesis, there is deduction, which is trying to test an hypothesis, and then there's abduction. Well, my understanding of that is a philosophical cop-out. In other words, someone's trying to fudge elements of both induction and deduction and rebrand it as abduction. And I think it is an unhelpful piece of intellectual masturbation. Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I agree with Andy that uh, we, we had actually a, a session, a very animated session on, uh, on Monday on abduction from Dr. Michael Foss. And uh, so at some point we hope that he will jump in and give us a little more on it. Uh, but uh, also, yeah, ev evidence in a narrow sense is, uh, it has this idea of a goal, and what is the evidence for? Uh, because if you don't know what you are looking, the, uh, what evidence you are seeking, you will obviously won't find it. Uh, so even you know, even, even let's say in the popular Sherlock Holmes case, there there is a crime. The crime is already known, and and the goal is to solve the crime. And therefore, the evidence that is being uh, gathered uh, uh, in 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 the case of Sherlock Holmes, uh, through very very sharp observational powers. In case of uh, us as researchers, through very good research strategies and methods, uh, always has certain goals in mind. Uh, the question I think that is uh, underlying some of the discussion that is happening in this room is uh, the, the, the inductive one: that what if we are trying to discover things uh, where the goal is not uh, is not yet known? And uh, except the general goal of quest of knowledge, uh, and and in that situation, what is the role, the meaning and the role of evidence? Uh, and uh, the argument that I made as as uh, as my uh, as my role in the debate, I will talk about my actual view uh, later. I was playing a role, obviously, uh, was that everything uh, is empirically derived. Including uh, things like uh, intuition and imaginations and ideas, uh, there is an empirical reality behind it, and therefore, uh, and I, I was therefore trying to obviously make the the logical leap that that empirical reality is the same thing as evidence. Uh, that there is an evidence, that evidentiary trail uh, that you can uh, that you can uh, attach to even things which are seemingly just coming out of somebody's mind, not out of uh, data or uh, empirical reality. So th that's the position that I am uh, I'm using it as a debater here.
short, he is saying that Link would never get a job here. And you would. I won't be too sure about that. <laughs> but because um, we, at least at the center, do very much what you just went through, and that's sort of our view of many things. So, so uh, we would not, never um, have people who only did what, what Nick is pretending to, or, or saying. He's, he's, he's not like this, I know he was. So. But uh, that, uh, let me ask something to, to uh, um, Andy. You started, I was also confused about the concept of evidence, because I thought that we need evidence for everything, but I understand you use evidence in, in two different, well, you don't use it, but evidence is used <coughs> objectively, I think. Because I would also say for inductive research, don't I need evidence from these people I speak with. But maybe I understand evidence in that sense, because I would say what they tell me is evidence of what they believe in. And they, 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 that may be called data, but I would call it evidence because it has a logical construct somehow, uh, what, they, what they are telling me. May I respond to you? Yeah, but let me just put one no, more. No, I'd like to respond now, before you confuse me. Before I confuse you. Yeah. Or confuse me. I, I'd like to respond to that, which is worth some good. Okay, well, in the English language, the word evidence is a very specific meaning. You can't use it as a floating variable. It means evidence of a certain thing that exists, or you think exists. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything else. It means what, what well, so it when, if you're doing inductive research and people tell you things, if you're doing authentic inductive research, that is not evidence, it is data. Because at the moment, you haven't analyzed it, you haven't synthesized it, you haven't uh, come sort of compared it, you haven't seen um, the true nature of that. But I think part of the confusion might be that some people claim to be using inductive research methods and actually they're not. For example, people who use qualitative data analysis call that uh, a kind of inductive research. It is not. Uh, inductive, uh, qualitative data analysis is all, it's based on verification. It's based on accuracy. It's based on being able to procure, provide an elaborate situation-specific description. In other words, it's hypothesis testing. And this is why I, the use of language is very crucial, because in the English language, we have a very vast vocabulary, and words have very specific meanings. And uh, that's, uh, from my point of view, the situation. Because if you're really doing inductive research, and you are having a conversation, where the respondent in the early stages, you have no idea what this means or what this doesn't mean. You have to have a reflective conversation with yourself, you've got to make notes, you've got to go back and ask them again and again and again until a pattern emerges. Because, uh, and then when it emerges and it's robust, you know what it is. But if you're doing qualitative data analysis, it would be evidence because you already start the process with a hypothesis, and you are trying to find evidence for it, which is okay and so right, but it's not inductive research. Am I confusing you? I hope not. So okay. you're clarifying what, where you put the limit. Yes. Uh, okay. I may not have exactly the same. Uh, Did you want to ask another question? Well, that, that's just a small one, uh, because you started out by having a sense of need. Which you probably uh, didn't uh, well, hold uh, almost as truth. Uh, but are you saying that all those you mentioned there, they are, have come out through deductive research? Is that, is that your point? And if we had to done uh, inductive research, we would have come to some other results. Is that what you're saying? We will never know what the inductive research has never done. Yeah. Exactly. But, uh, that's also but the important thing about me is that they don't have to be true to be powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but but are they coming out of are those you mentioned? Have they all come out of deductive research? Yes. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Just, just, just. Thank you. I'm going to go to the issue of the music of the basic system. It is not one of the indicators that you are referring to the evidence. I'm sorry, I. This is a question. I, I can't hear you clearly. Can you move the microphone to your face? Um, I'm asking about the use of this question. Because in dinner theory, you are testing the hypothesis. The user yes. of what? Research question. Research question. Research question. The user. Question. The user. Okay. Yes. Okay. So what's the question? Uh, the question is if you are you are you are you are using the research question in the inductive way, is it not a evidence? In the deductive way. No, inductive. 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 Well, can I reply? Obviously, for any research activity, you've got to have a point of departure. And when you're doing inductive research, you are trying to reveal the main concerns of the people with whom you are researching. Okay? At the moment, you don't know what they are. So, it can't be deductive. And um, it's more subtle than that, because very often, the people you speak to, they don't know what it is either because it's so obvious to them, they never have to articulate it. And so what you have to do is to discover it by doing the whole series of processes which we're going to talk about this afternoon. So going back to your original notion, yes, if you're using the research question as uh, the research question mission in deductive research is to try and prove or reject the hypothesis. The research question in induction is to try and reveal, discover the things that are the main concern to the people you are looking at. And this is why there is a big important difference because um, I, um, I know, as my colleagues do know, that every research community, every particular interest, have issues, hot button issues that they are interested in as researchers. But you shouldn't make the assumption that these are of any consequence at all to the community you are researching. They may not be. When I, when I put on my hat, I am playing uh, me rather than the debater role that I was playing. Uh, and uh, uh, so again, uh, so this is me answering, not my debate role. Uh, I think the, the difference between research questions in a deductive oriented uh, uh, hypothetical, hypothetical deductive way of doing research versus a much more inductive oriented way of doing research is that, uh, I think Andy already pointed it out, but I'm just going to elaborate a little. The research question in hypothetical deductive uh, way of doing research is, is very sharply uh, worded because there is a hypothesis behind it, one or more hypotheses behind it. Um, what uh, I recommend when people are doing more inductive exploratory type of research is that the research question would be uh, somewhat like what, what uh, when you see, let's say, on, uh, uh, on television sometimes, you can see that certain people who are interviewing uh, long interviews on television, they are just saying a very, very little. And the person that they are interviewing could be a politician or an artist or an actor or whoever, is just gushing with a lot of information. Uh, it's pouring a lot of information. Because the question that is asked is, is so uh, uh, inviting and open that it leads to a lot of uh, things coming out from the respondent. 
So, and, and, and one way that, um, that we, we say that in, uh, in, in research uh, methods is that the, the research question, uh, preferably in uh, the more inductive style of doing research, should be what is called a grand tour question. Uh, you know, a very sort of open-ended question that does not threaten uh, the, the person who's answering the question and that, uh, that, uh, that uh, encourages the person to open up a lot uh, and reveal uh, all kinds of things, look, uh, not just about what was asked, but about uh, tangential things and surrounding things. Uh, and uh, so it, 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 we, we also call it, it's a non-directive way of asking questions. And that, that way of asking questions, research, or posing research questions, is uh, generally, at least in the beginning, more useful in inductive side research, in the non-directive, the grand tour way of asking questions. The discussion is about knowledge. What, what is knowledge and how can we break knowledge? And, and you both agree about that, that science has some rules. That, yeah, uh, no matter what <coughs> perspective. Um, and, and we can discuss that um, and, and so on. Uh, but you, you also point out that reasoning in, in some way and empirical is, is important for, for science. Uh, history. And history teaches us a lot of different things, but history teaches us that knowledge is very much connected to power. Uh, and you said with a bit in relation to how can I understand powerful people in relation to description of the empirical reality. Uh, but what, what, what do you say about that? Can, can science and power be separated? So let's say a word about science. Our old friend, Kel Popper, that's somebody who's going to be on the subject. And he says there is no more to the scientific method than, the, than being systematic. The more systematic you are, the more you can declare it is scientific or not systematic. And by systematic, it has to be transparent, it has to be observable, has to be repeatable by other people who know work. So, yes, science is important. The second part of our question is related to how long is it? Okay. Well, uh, maybe business school should just have one book in the library. That is The Prince by Machiavelli. And he is uh, <coughs> writing a lot about power. And uh, it is certainly an important entity. But um, the researcher certainly has to understand power because he or she has to uh, negotiate with power and finesse around power in order to achieve whatever research they are doing. So you never pick battles you know you're going to lose. And so you, you have to um, do it a certain way. For example, even powerful universities, people, have vulnerabilities. And so to negotiate with power as a researcher, you also discover their vulnerabilities. I was once approached by a Chinese guy. In, I, was, I was in the paper in Stockholm. I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. He was in his mid-twenties, from, from Shanghai, and he would say, I'm very worried. I said, well, I said, well, I'm studying this famous university in the UK as, as a PhD researcher. I've been there two and a half years. I've had one meeting with a zoo advisor. I am the only son of this Chinese family. My family have to mortgage their apartment for me to be here. My PhD finishes in six months. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I've noticed my supervisor seem to care about what I'm doing. I said, well, you've got to understand how to negotiate this power nexus you're in. <clears throat> the vulnerability of the university, one of the main ones, 
a bad public relations. They don't want to read an article in the press about being sued for mal-supervision practice. And uh, so you have to find a lawyer who is a junior and have an action against the university for their fault behavior to you. And what happened was interesting because the university repaid his fees, they found him a good supervisor, and now he's a, he's a professor in Shanghai. You know, so you can't avoid power, you have to be, what can one say, you have to be uh, mindful and sophisticated in the way you deal with power, which exists. Yeah, I, I think that this is a, a, a very core question. Again, I'm wearing my hat on me. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, the question of knowledge and power is, is extremely uh, important. But also it's a question that is uh, very often ignored, particularly in fields like management research. Uh, I had not uh, opened uh, either the TV or the computer this morning and Andy and I were sitting in our hotel for breakfast and he gave me the news which clearly demonstrates the relationship between knowledge and power. He told me that the, in the United States, the FBI director, Comey, was fired by uh, Trump, President Trump. Uh, and, and comment that Andy made, which I completely agree with, agreed with, is that Comey is getting very close to truth. Uh, and because, so, so if, if our request, as we have been saying, if it's truth, uh, he was getting very close to truth and power intervened. Uh, and, 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 and Bauer said, no, no, this, this is too uncomfortable and we don't want you to, uh, to reveal uh, whatever you are finding, uh, that truth is not going to be very helpful uh, to the political power structure as it exists at this point in time. But on a philosophical level, uh, of course, in the late 20th century, uh, the work of Michel Foucault is absolutely uh, central here. Uh, he has written a lot about knowledge and power. Uh, in every field of knowledge, there is an archaeology, uh, and, and, and uh, the archaeology is generally not discussed and somewhat, somewhat hidden. Uh, it, it is taken for granted, uh, and it is only when we begin to expose the archaeology of knowledge that we begin to see where, what role did power play at different points in the development of that, that body of knowledge. Uh, and, uh, and this is not easy, particularly in fields which are uh, somewhat uh, very heavily wedded to uh, uh, the hypothetical deductive positivist empiricist paradigm. Uh, and uh, uh, my role in about almost 40 years of doing research is uh, occasionally try to expose the archaeology of this in, in the field of marketing, which is my area. And of course, uh, I get called on. Well, first of all, it, it gets rejected in the journals. But if it gets published, then I get called all kinds of names uh, by, by very powerful people in the field. Uh, so uh, trying to, to you know, do that excavation and show the archaeology, it, it's, 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 it's not easy. We have a couple of minutes for some questions. Yeah, first of all, as management researcher, of course, we have to read a lot of articles which are based on uh, evidence. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's also useful, I find, uh, to do that. What thing irritates me, or two things irritate me when they uh, write them, uh, give me what I would like. One thing is that their discussion or their, uh, discuss their discussion sections are very short because they've already proved everything through the figures. And the second one, and that's even the worst one, they never debate the things they didn't uh, confirm. And there probably is the very interesting things. Uh, all those they confirmed were just, you know, derived from this truth, so it was easy to cover that one. And we all expect they confirm those, but those they didn't confirm. Why didn't they debate them? That's one point uh, uh, also in relation to, to NBCTs. The other point is uh, that uh, long time ago I read an article from, from uh, uh, Scotland where they investigated the, uh, the textile industry. And they were, uh, they were constructivists, people. 
But even so, they said we can use uh, the normal hypothesis testing uh, methods because this industry has five years, 500 years of history. And through that history, there are patterns. Patterns have evolved. And these patterns, although they are socially derived and socially constructed, can still be analyzed through uh, normal uh, uh, deductive reasoning and, and hypothesis testing. And I think that's also something I consider when I look into a, a field, asking myself, do I expect any social patterns in this uh, area I'm now doing research in? Uh, if yes, well, maybe I should think about what can I then reveal, how can I reveal these patterns using uh, deductive reasoning and, and qualitative methods. If I come to my conclusion, no, I don't believe this is a new field, there are no patterns yet, uh, what they call design and innovation, uh, so let me use more inductive methods. So I think that I would like to have your opinion about that approach. When my mentor, Barney Glazer, found our ground theory, did his PhD at Columbia University light years ago, he didn't speak to anyone at all. He, to do his PhD, he, his entire data was secondary data. Never had a conversation with anybody. And what he was interested in was to discover what it was to be a career academic. He was a young man and he thought, is this for me or, or what? And um, by just using secondary data only, he was able to induct some interesting information. That the first thing, if, if you, the, the kind of um, received wisdom at the time was that people want to be in the academic community for very, very positive reasons, you know. We want to uh, improve the body of knowledge for society, right? But actually, what he found was a stronger, deep-seated, latent pattern, was that the real reason for most people having success in academic life was not so much that, but was the pursuit of recognition. They wanted their name up in lights, in the big journals and what have you. And I'm not saying that you're wrong in that per se. It's not about right and wrong. It's a very different aspiration to create knowledge and to be recognized. Sometimes you can do both. But uh, this is why the role of publishing is so critical to a career in academia but you will never be recognized unless you publish. So there's a kind of uh, dichotomy there. The first part of your question, I have forgotten already, but it was very interesting. Can you just briefly remember what it was? It was something to do with reading other journals. Though. Well, the, 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 the discussion sections are very short, okay. number one. And secondly, things which were uh, no, not, not confirmed, confirmed are, are not discussed. Okay. Well, that is what I call selective amnesia. Well, where, where people deliberately choose to just, oh, that's forget about that one. It doesn't fit my mindset. And this is a problem when you use evidence as a main thrust of a research uh, methodology, because you, you're already preconceived. So if things don't fit into your preconception, you tend not to take them too seriously. Unless you're a very good researcher and say, oh my God, this is interesting, where the hell did that come from? And you go and follow it. But I, what I'm trying to, we, this is set up as an Anglo-Saxon style debate where one is right, one is wrong. And by now, hopefully, you realize that any approach is okay, providing you use it in, a, in an appropriate manner in a given situation. But the problem that's happened in the area of management is that there is a dominant research paradigm, namely deductive evidence-based research, which is like 90% of all research. And that is an imbalance in my humble opinion. Yeah, I, I want to comment a little bit on the second part of your question. 
and that is when you're in dealing with new phenomena and emergent phenomena. Uh, and, and more and more, I, I think this group uh, that we have assembled here from different universities who are working, almost all of them are working with uh, <coughs> topics which are not well established, uh, uh, but emergent contexts. And uh, they all face this challenge. Uh, I have a couple of comments. One is that uh, uh, the methods to uh, establish patterns in, in such type of settings are, 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 can be very difficult to, uh, to come up with. Um, there so are there no are patterns. Hmm? There are no patterns in a new Well, world. I don't agree with that. There are always patterns. Even if it's very, very new, there are patterns. But the, but the, the thing is, those patterns may be hazy patterns. They could be patterns that change and so forth. Uh, let me give you a brief example, a little, little tangential, but there is a very famous uh, social geographer called Richard Florida. He, very, very, he writes a lot academically, but he's also writing all the time in popular media. And he came up with the idea that cities in the, uh, in, in the world wide that do well have a, what is called a creative class. And the creative class is what drives the economies of these cities and so forth. Uh, just about a year ago, he has begun to revise. Uh, so that was a pattern. I mean, he showed both empirically as well as through uh, good arguments that this is the case. And now he's beginning to revise uh, his pattern that he discovered, saying, sure, there are this creative class, but these same cities are then becoming uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, gentrified and yuppified and very, very expensive, and, and all the other support uh, uh, um, type of infrastructure that you need are being driven out. And you can see that probably in Copenhagen also. Uh, that, you know, sure there are some people who are thriving there, and then there are a lot of people who are finding it very difficult to live. So this is an example that he, he had discovered a pattern, he was very confident, he was promoting it, and now he's uh, retracting and backtracking, saying the pattern that I discovered is probably needs revising. So there are always patterns, but uh, uh, how to discover them, uh, and then the evidentiary uh, 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 basis for that uh, could change when it's an emergent phenomenon. So there, these are some of the issues that arise in, uh, uh, and then we don't always have the, the luxury of creating a very, uh, very detailed, uh, uh, systematic, grounded theory type approach in because we just, either, either the setting is not permissive of it or we don't have the time or we don't have the skills. Uh, so we, we have to sort of be a little bit uh, of uh, what is called, we have to be a bricolier to use a French word in, in our methodological uh, sense. Just uh, um, one last question I want to follow up a bit on, that, on Leticia's question when she asked about building knowledge from existing knowledge. But to rephrase that and uh, link to what Nick said in his presentation that we cannot advance knowledge through intuition. So can we be uh, arm, arm, arm chairing around and create uh, knowledge through intuition? I think it brings to you on that. Can you? Oh, with that. Give me okay, time. so the hat is, the hat is off, and so I, I would play the debater role and say no, uh, in, intuition, uh, it is, it is, uh, uh, in, intuition is uh, coming from empirical sources, the material realities that a person has been exposed to, uh, and you, you, know, you, you could probably find uh, almost a, a, a specific neurological connection inside the brain if you had a brain scan meter as to where that intuition is coming from. There is no such thing as uh, intuition that does not have an empirical root. Okay, so between our ears is the most fantastic supercomputer that has ever been devised. And most of us only use about 10% of it. And one of the reasons why that happens is because of education. It dumbs us down quite considerably. When we go to school, it's more about social control than it is about actually learning things. And then when we uh, leave school and go to college or university, it loosens up a bit, but not much. And uh, so the real skill that is useful in, in inductive research is called theoretical sensitivity. The skill of attuning our brain 
to cutting through the story to see the concept which is driving the story. And with all things, you start small and get big. So, to start with, you use your brain in uh, maybe slightly unusual ways. So, the first thing you have to do is to see things differently. In other words, when things are apparently chaotic, this should not be an alarming phenomenon. This should be an exhilarating phenomenon. Because chaos is a necessary prerequisite to understanding. The more chaos you're experiencing, the greater the potential for ultimate understanding is there. And the other element to this is uh, understanding is a delayed action phenomenon. Unless you're a super genius already connected to your super brain, most of us it takes quite a bit of time for this to emerge. But what you have to do, having given it time, is don't strangle it, don't deny it, and use it. And uh, probably our most intellectual, useful time of our life is when we're asleep. Because our brain can process the experiences that we've had during the previous 24 hours without any interference from our, ourselves. And how many times do we wake up in the morning with a problem half solved that was confusing the day before? So instead of treating that as an unusual one off experience, there are ways in which you can perpetuate that, which I'll talk about later. Um, I don't know where. Um, this afternoon. And uh, so, in that sense, I believe that um, everything is in music is in patterns, mathematics is patterns, human behavior is patterns, everything is patterns. And the reason why the brain can remember so much is because it selectively um, only remembers what it needs to know. So at the intersection, it's like the, in computer science, something called uh, packet switching. Uh, the, the way in which the internet works, uh, di digits, uh, digital information is thrown over the Atlantic or under the Atlantic, but it is compressed as it is sent. And when it arrives at the receiving area, it bursts exactly into the right pattern. And that's happening in our brains all the time. So we have to find techniques which enable us just to remember the links between the patterns and not the patterns themselves. And that's how memory works. Um, memory, understanding it, in my experience, is rarely taught in schools. And yet it's such a basic thing for us to get by with. And those of us, no, I'm talking myself, those people with good memories have, have kind of stumbled across it rather than being introduced to it. We are far more, people are far more capable of, of, of what they think they are. You know, our, our capacities are in our limit, in my opinion. Okay. Um, so we need some uh, closing statements. Uh, who will do the closing statements first? John, I think I'm in first. Okay, my, uh, after that arrogant statement, my Concluding remark is to do with humility. Only when we acknowledge the depth of our ignorance can we start to understand things and have a little flash of wisdom from time to time. It is our preconceptions, our ignorance, that is blocking us from seeing that which is already there. And. Um, the important thing from a research point of view, when these uh, flashes arise, never tell anybody. Write it down. Because these are ephemeral experiences. And so um, there are ways to do this. So when I'm supervising someone, and someone having some intellectual difficulty, their person is not oh, I know what I'm doing. Oh. I say, go away. Write it down. And then we'll talk about it. Because this can disappear just like that. That's the important thing. And um, the other, I should also, to be fair, 
mentioned that using inductive research can also be problematic because um, the biggest weakness of it, in my experience, is the skill of the actual researcher. You have to be quite a skilled researcher to do inductive research. You've got to be properly trained, you've got to know what you're doing, you've got to be in an in a appropriate, supervised environment. Whereas with many inductive research, once you have mastered the procedures of whatever computer system you're, you're using, you just stick variables in and you get an answer. And so in that sense, it's not reliable if they make that sense. So, I will um, let my friend talk because the last time he talked, he did misunderstood. Thank you. Well, in, in closing, uh, I'm, uh, remember, I'm not very really happy. Uh, in closing, I, I would like to re-emphasize the extremely important role of uh, empirical reality, the lived world as, as it exists, as it is observable, the evidence that we draw from it, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the world of facts as the only useful and significant basis to develop knowledge. Uh, yes, there are temptations uh, to have uh, flashes of insights, of uh, uh, flights of imagination, uh, and uh, uh, bouts of intuition, uh, because they seem to be exciting and they seem to uh, indicate that we have suddenly had this aha moment of discovery. Uh, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you think about it carefully, uh, and if you talk to the very, very capable, uh, extremely uh, 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 well-resourced uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the neuroscientists of today, they'll tell you that everything that your brain is doing. Uh, there is uh, a neural network inside that is making that happen. Uh, it is not something that is happening from any kind of a magical uh, way of the brain working. It is very explainable uh, in an empirical sense. Uh, and so I would end the case by uh, making an extremely strong argument in favor of uh, taking empiricism as the starting and the ending point of all research. Thank you. Now it's time to vote. Can we go back to your initial voting and see if uh, your perspectives changed? I just want to ask whose perspective changed? Can you raise your hand? Or, yeah, okay. So, uh, Help, what did you have before? Uh, so before I had against the motion, so now I can the motion. Okay. And it's mainly to do with uh, the definitions of evidence uh, and how it's applied in this situation. Okay. You guys, no changes? Okay, well thank you very much. Let's uh, give up. After half the day, Ah, oh, okay. Now, all voted for the motion. Can you raise your hands for the motion? Okay, so I assume we're against the motion. 50-50. Yeah, okay, that's uh, let's do this way. No, I think Putin has intervened. Yeah, Putin. You've been hands. It's just numbers. Okay. Well, uh, let's give a round of applause to our advisors. Uh, Thank you very much for participating in this debate.